Well, good afternoon, everyone. And I should say good morning uh, for those who are not in Europe and actually following us from afar. I'm Francine Lacquan. Welcome to our virtual dialogue, part of our special Bloomberg briefings looking at COVID-19 and, of course, the impact the pandemic has had on economies around the world. Now, we're delighted today to be joined by the Italian Central Bank Governor. He's Ignazio Visco. But first, a short recap of what we know on the Italian economy. Now, Italy, like many economies around the world, is being hurt by bankruptcies and unemployment with the risk of political and social tensions actually increasing. Now, this is what the economy has been doing so far. It shrank 5.3% in the first quarter, the most since the data series began in the mid-1990s, and then a deeper contraction is expected this quarter. Uh, there were also concerns about delays in channeling aid, including unemployment relief to those who needed it, and to the economic sectors hit hardest by the measures. What we know, of course, as Italy emerges from this lockdown is that schools remain closed until September, and the PM actually outlined priorities, including broadband for all households, energy investments, and reducing bureaucracy. Now, with the governor today, we'll talk, of course, about monetary policy, how the economy will recover, and European Central Bank. Thank you again to Bloomberg LP, um, who's in a unique position to organize this briefing, and we have received some questions. So thank you, everyone who sent those through. We have dozens and dozens of questions. A couple of housekeeping before I go to the governor. If you lose connection, please do bear with us. Sometimes you just need to refresh your brow browsers, and that um, does a trick. It can be frustrating, but I think if any good can come with 2020, is that most of us have actually upgraded our internet connections. You can also submit further a Q and A once this starts. So now, um, but bear with me because I know we've been getting a lot of questions. So I'll try and fit as many questions as I can. So Governor Visco, thank you so much, and and welcome to uh, this briefing. Let's just maybe start with the basics, but the difficult basics to get right, which is how deep will this crisis be? What's a reasonable range for the Italian economy's recovery hypothesis? Well, thank you, first of all, good afternoon. Well, we are uh, clearly uh, very much in the uh, analytical mode. That is, we still don't are unable really to provide the single point estimates for what is going to take place in the coming months. Uh, we have uh, done some exercises as part of the projection exercise of the Euro system. And at the end, since we have a very, very uh, high uncertainty now, uh, I think that the best thing to do is to provide scenario analysis. And we have two basic scenarios. I understand that today, uh, also, the OECD is coming up with two scenarios. Basically, the, it's also difficult to give the odds of to one or the other. But say one is uh, a say baseline in which there is a, a prosecution, a, a maintenance of the current path of improvement on the contagion. Uh, there is uh, no fear of other uh, containment measures taking place. The global economy will uh, not be subject to further disruptions. And in that case, our evaluation, all considered, is that the economy might uh, have a f reduction in output of about 9%. Uh, and inflation basically being uh, at zero. Uh, but uh, if there is uh, what the OECD calls a double hit, uh, uh, some uh, new uh, outbreak of the pandemic, even if not as strong as we observed it so far, uh, and if the global economy still uh, suffers, that is, this uh, contagion is not over, say there are uh, uh, new centers in which we can observe uh, New, new contagion and new epi the epidemics expanding, then we have a more severe scenario there, which somehow uh, ciphers at 13% the fall in output and the negative uh, price changes for this year and the next, and a very slow recovery afterwards. Now, this is uh, clearly, as I said, uh, dependent on the uh, evolution of the pandemics the confidence effects that we may still have, but it accounts for the reaction uh, so far from the monetary side and also the fiscal side. Um, we evaluate at about two percentage points the improvement the fiscal has provided us for this year. 
So what will be the legacy on the economy? Do you, do you worry, let's take bankruptcies, unemployment, and let's take you know the, the specter of deflation. Out of those three, what worries you the most for the Italian economy? Yeah. The, 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 the uh, bankruptcies or insolvencies, as you like, uh, is not, not obviously very difficult to say. Uh, it is clear that uh, there will be uh, problems on uh, loans that uh, will be observable in the coming years. Uh, there has been a part of these fiscal packages, uh, not only in, in Italy, but uh, or many other countries, Germany, France and others, uh, a part of the guarantees issued by, by the state, which should uh, somehow cover part of the risks that banks may face in the coming, in the coming months and years. Uh, the labor market situation, I think, is, is very difficult. It is difficult for a number of reasons. First of all, it is hard to tell from the statistics. For example, uh, the unemployment rate that we have uh, been, obser been observing now doesn't tell much. We had uh, the uh, somehow uh, uh, ban on dismissals put forward by the government until September. We have uh, an wage equalization fund. We have observed a, a major mm -hmm. reduction in total hours worked, uh, basically with the lockdown 30% of, uh, of our system probably has stopped. Uh, but the uh, wage supplementation fund is a, a, welfare, a welfare instrument that uh, provides uh, for payments of wages and salaries through this, this, this fund rather than directly to, to the enterprises. And about 8 million people at least. And uh, we have observed the population. Those who do not work and do not apply for work, do not intend for work. 750 piece, people less in participation rate, which is uh, which basically tells you that the unemployment rate does not tell much. What matters is the employment rate. There has been a reduction, mostly of temporary workers, of about 250,000 people in the last couple of months. There is also some signs of improvement now. We have some preliminary data from some Italian regions that say, tells that there is some recovery, but we are still much below the 2019 data. And the uh, other legacy is that there are a number of works that probably are more affected than others. Think about those who work in the tourist uh, area in which there is, uh, there is clearly a, a lot of uh, fears for the coming months. Uh, there is uh, uh, those who work in uh, recreation, in food services, in personal mm -hmm. services. So there is uh, a substantial asymmetry, I would say, uh, between professions. So those who work in uh, the public sector, those who work in yeah. uh, uh, in, even in some manufacturing, they are more mm -hmm. secure than others. So, so there is an issue of distribution which we have to, to consider. Uh, you had the third point, if I, if I remember. Uh, uh, deflation, the, deflationary my, concerns, yeah. I understand. But before that, I would say my, my main concern is that uh, it will be not clear what kind of new equilibrium, new normal we are heading towards. And so how to, all of us, uh, will change both our consumer patterns and how the response from the part of the business sector to these changes in patterns will be. Deflation is a consequence of demand being extremely low. Um, the low in, in, in the, this, uh, the upper gap is, is rising. Mm -hmm. Wages will be extremely contained. And uh, it is not only an issue of uh, Italy, Europe, uh, advanced economies, it's also an issue of emerging economies. This implies that even raw material prices are going down dramatically. We have been observing oil prices, obviously. It was already clear in, the, in February when we met uh, the G20 in uh, Saudi Arabia that uh, the Chinese uh, uh, crisis had 
brought had an effect on oil prices. Now we, we are observing this and we are projecting this to stay for some time. This uh, uh, coupled with the uh, say core element of, uh, of the price level uh, will uh, probably stay with us for some time. The risk is that this inflation is uh, really not contained and this is why we are so active on the monetary policy side. We have been observing tightening the financial markets because inflation expectations are going down faster than the interest rates and the overall risk of a spiral cannot be excluded for the time being it has been clearly contained by the extreme easiness in our monetary policy stance not only in the in the euro system but also uh, across i would say uh, old economies uh, the uh, basic issue is to avoid this to, to really to, to to stop it and to have uh, price stability restored and governor on, on monetary policy italy is very dependent on these ecb purchases you know how can we have guarantees that the ecb will actually support you know that that its support for italy will be there forever I don't know. I mean, this is uh, the ECB purchases is part of uh, our decisions uh, that uh, started uh, many years ago, exactly because this is a major crisis. But we were still not in a fully fledged recovery, high demand, and so on. As a matter of fact, uh, before the COVID crisis erupted, uh, we were basically. Uh, foreseeing a halt in, in GDP growth and inflation still far from from the what we define price stability for the time being is close uh, to to two percent uh, and we are now at point uh, point three something like that so it's, it's, it's very low now the the, the, the issue here about the kind of policy is that monetary policy is having a very easy stance. It is not only for Italy, it is for the Euro area at large. This is, uh, comes uh, with a package of instruments. Uh, basically, one is tries to maintain expectations about our stance. For, for a guidance, tries to tell uh, how how long we will we will maintain this stance and will be ready really to even continue easing. The second uh, clearly interest rates have been the main instruments up to up to some time ago and we are still looking at them. But then we have to create liquidity, money supply, and to create money supply we have to purchase assets. To purchase assets we have to decide which assets to purchase. Obviously in Europe there is much more uh, assets in the public sector that we, we can buy than in private sector. But even in the private sector, we are very, very active, as you may understand, from the purchases of corporate bond, bonds. On the public sector side, it is true that the ECB is, uh, uh, the governing council ECB has decided uh, massive purchases. Uh, and the national central banks are purchasing. It's not the ECB only that is, the ECB is purchasing a small part of that, but uh, um, most of this is, is in our balance sheets and we are active every day. We are uh, really uh, very much in, in the business of being careful but active. And we have various programs, as you understand. Uh, besides that, we have the main programs to provide liquidity to banks in a va various, with various instruments targeted uh, pan pandemic uh, long-term uh, refinancing and so on. On the purchase of uh, public debt, uh, yes, it is. It is. It has been uh, uh, large. There are. There is a difference between what we are doing now and what we used to do uh, up to February. Even in March, uh, beginning of March, we increased a little bit our purchases of uh, um, the asset purchase program. That mm -hmm. is the public sector purchase program was enhanced, but then we decided to have this temporary addition, which has been last week, we uh, increased it substantially uh, in size, uh, and which has also a component in terms of duration, in terms of reinvestment, which are uh, important, mm -hmm. exactly to, for two reasons. The first is to enhance the uh, 
uh, easiness of the, the monetary stance because this is the best response to a substantial fall in demand and we don't want the hysteresis uh, being uh, such that then demand remains low and very low for a long time. The second is fragmentation. Uh, the uh, COVID has hit different countries in different ways, some earlier, some later, some more in depth, others less. Italy has been hit uh, earlier and it has been hit in particular sectors for example, tourism, I was mentioning before, it provides 6% of uh, total employment, double of it, mm -hmm. uh, including indirect factors, uh, and therefore needed a response. But uh, clearly Spain, France, Germany, all our countries have been hit in different ways and all have uh, responded. And the, resp the, monetary po the difference is monetary policy is a common response. Fiscal policies are national responses. The new addition of instruments at the European Union level is very welcome because it provides the uh, obvious uh, uh, counterpart to the common monetary policy. Now, is this a major legacy? Well, it is, it is something that we have still to uh, deal with, understand. In Japan, they are... Uh, uh, have a much higher increase in the uh, Bank of Japan balance sheet. Uh, the balance sheet in the US, in the Euro area, uh, are more or less similar. As a matter of fact, the increase in the US in the first months of this year has been even stronger than ours. In levels, we are more or less the same, and we are we have a plan of increase for the next uh, next uh, months. The, the uh, UK also has a substantial increase. So it, this is a response. It is, uh, uh, we have to evaluate how to proceed in the future, how uh, until there is a subdued demand, inflation is uh, so low and uh, expected inflation risks being the anchor. I think there is no, no, nothing to say about this. If there would be signs of uh, increase in, uh, in inflation, clear increase in inflation and there will be demand which will recover, then obviously the monetary policy has to, all the reasons to become, if, if necessary, gradually uh, more restrictive. But for the time being, this is not the, in the cards. Um, Governor, do you share the view expressed by some of your colleagues that the capital key is an uncalled for constraint in the ECB's pandemic program? Well, I don't share that. I think the um, exactly the, the, this uh, PEPP is, uh, and I don't, I'm not sure that the colleagues have said in this in the way you are you are exposing this. Uh, they are, uh, you have to be careful with the words. Uh, the the I think the the main quality of this uh, PEPP, which is uh, which is uh, temporary, uh, is really to be flexible. And the flexibility is uh, as uh, it is written in the in uh, in our decisions. Uh, it is uh, flexible over time, over asset uh, assets that are purchased, uh, and uh, and obviously it is also flexible according to to, to jurisdictions, because the, there is uh, some turmoil in certain areas which have to be countered immediately because if you allow that to, to manta be maintained, the financial fragmentation makes the uh, risk of disruptions uh, and the contagion of these risks through all within all the area more likely. So this is the flexibility is there. This, does this mean that the capital key, this kind of thing is uh, something that is going, to, is going to be violated? First of all, we should not exaggerate the issue. If you look at the figures, we are still uh, within uh, reasonable ranges and there is no, no nothing to be worried. Secondly, the reference point for the main uh, uh, purchase program remains uh, reasonable. We do not, I mean, we, we can discuss whether we should look at stocks or flows whether, o over time, uh, day by day, but I, I would not be concerned with that. Frankly, I think that... Uh, uh, overall, uh, obviously, there is an issue of feasibility. 
some in some mm -hmm. cases there might be not enough uh, uh, paper to purchase and right. therefore right. And, and, and as i said before the the uh, purchase of public debt is mostly uh, there because it is the uh, kind of instrument that is obvious to, for uh, creating more uh, substantial po i think uh, I, I don't remember the figures but i wouldn't think that uh, we in the last since we we started this new new program uh, we bought less than uh, 40 50 billion euros of but corporate. but governor you basically but you basically believe that the program in its current form has sufficient built-in flexibility that was kind of the question yes Yes, I think it has sufficient flexibility. Uh, obviously, uh, it has uh, it has one major objective, that of maintaining the stance very easy to counter the the, the, the fall in demand, in aggregate demand, and. The same. in certain countries and and others um governor there, there are critics i guess that are worried that ecb policy make it less likely for italy to go through the reforms that the country needs no i don't think so frankly i i think it is uh, very clear that the country needs reforms i made um, also recently a number of statements about what kind of reforms and so on. Uh, I, I think that you, you should, uh, and, and it is, you're right, it's a long time that reform should take place, but it is not because there is a, a purchase of public debt that the reforms are lagging behind. Indeed, uh, you need reforms to increase the rate of growth of the economy. And, uh, and certainly monetary policy cannot increase the rate of growth of the, poly, uh, of the economy. Purchasing debt and to create money is uh, uh, useful for level reasons, to increase the level of aggregate demand, reduce the upper gap, uh, raise the possibility of the uh, uh, economy going back to employment that is sufficiently high. But uh, it is not a substitute for measures that uh, increase the rate of growth, the rate of growth of productivity, mm -hmm. innovation, uh, and all the uh, improvements that uh, uh, the economy needs now to face the effects of COVID, but also the effects that we knew, but also the needs that we knew for some time of uh, uh, improving the environment, the f f uh, fighting climate change, uh, making digital uh, digitalization a, a, a more uh, uh, used instruments for both the uh, manufacturing and the service sector and especially for the uh, public sector so these things have to be do, done uh, and uh, and i understand that uh, in in at the public level uh, the government is engaged now exactly in trying to define a plan for that. As a matter of fact, uh, I quoted recently John Minor Keynes, uh, who uh, wrote a pamphlet uh, in uh, just with the, U the, the, the Great Britain, the UK, entering into the Second World War, to somehow advise the government how to, what to do. And he was not, not insisting on the short term. He was insisting of the long term. He said the best strategy for the short term, basically, is to have a good plan for the long term, for when the war is over or for when our uh, the, the, this pandemic is over, which is not a war. I mean, I, I don't like to compare that to a war, but I like to think that this forces us to a state of uh, difficulties that 
can only be overcome if we have a clear idea of where we want to go in the future. And that needs, that implies that we have to start with the current uh, uh, levels of uh, mm -hmm. disequilibria, of, uh, uh, lagging behind in a number of sectors. And this is, I think, has nothing to do with monetary policy being... Uh, monetary policy can... Um, it is one of the few countries which has had a sizable primary surplus. The big problem is the rate of growth which has been too low and indeed we started this, uh, this pre-COVID, if you want, uh, period with um, a level of income not yet back to where it was before the global financial crisis. Um, Governor, I have a lot of questions coming in, so I'm going to try, you know, I'm trying to incorporate mine and, and the ones that are um, coming in. Maybe let's start with, Governor, what is your opinion on Italy using ESM funds? There are a number of people have been asking that question. Well, I think I gave a testimony in uh, in Parliament uh, a few months ago, before the COVID uh, started. Uh, I, I think that these funds, now it is clear, they come uh, without strings attached. Uh, it is clear that uh, they have to be used for particular reasons. This is the only the only requirement. So if needed, I don't see any risk to use. But we should not consider that they, this is manna. Uh, this is still a loan. Uh, rather than being a loan in the market, it is a loan uh, with respect to Europe, but it is a loan. Uh, the gain, there are two, two things which are useful. The first is that the interest rate is a little bit lower. of the uh, availability of instruments which are available at the European level. So uh, if, uh, if uh, it can be put uh, in, uh, in use uh, effectively, uh, I don't think uh, there is any substantial problem. But obviously it has to be effective. Uh, it is, uh, I, I don't buy all those who say that uh, Italy has to be punished because it didn't do things in the past, so better, better goes in the austere mode because that, that is meaningless here. Uh, we can rewrite uh, history books and try to understand when uh, the Italian public debt started, what made things worse, uh, the 1980s, the 1992 crisis, which was not due to Italy, <laughs> And, and the, it came after the unification of Germany, the major surpluses of certain countries, which complain about, about the Italian being perhaps not that frugal, but Italy is one of the most frugal on the private debt side. So the private debt in Italy is extremely low. Uh, and local debt is the lowest. Uh, uh, the, so, so the public public debt is a substitute for private debt but in other countries there is extremely high private debt very dangerous as public debt is dangerous so we should be careful with words and careful what we say about about all these issues on the other hand uh, those who say that we do not want to use the european funds because this is a, a kind of plot against the country we have to i think they are also wrong because this is no plot this is uh, a way to put resources uh, where they are needed. And if you are not able to raise them by yourself, there is no problem in, in, in temporarily to, re, to, to use those which are available. I, I, I think we should be pragmatic, and this is the first thing, and uh, efficient. So it is very important how you spend the, the resources that you are able to raise and uh, yeah. uh, be careful in 
not making statements that may have the negative effect to have your own interest rates, that is those which are paid on the paper that you put in the, in, in the market increasing. Mm -hmm. What policy response, this is another question from someone who's listening in, what policy response will be needed if a second lockdown were to be imposed on Italy and Europe? This is, uh, this is uh, really, it's very difficult to say. Uh, obviously, if there is uh, a, a second hit, uh, we have to understand from uh, experts what does it mean. It may, it may be temporary, it will be limited. Uh, it will be local, uh, focused, and so on. It's interesting that in, in Italy, there has been this major problem in northern, in northern Italy, much less uh, in, uh, in southern and central Italy, even if all have responded in an equal way uh, to the lockdown with a lot of care. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, not only in the, let's say, private, uh, uh, households uh, mode, but also in uh, uh, the workplace, uh, and, and still there is a lot of care, I would say, uh, in this. Now, the, the, the issue here, I think, is for certain sectors. If there is a second lockdown, then there are, uh, there are uh, two effects, I see. The first is fear, because uh, fear is very important in terms of what we do, how we behave, uh, how we restore habits. Uh, clearly, there are new cons consumer patterns. There is now a lot of online shopping that was not there before. Uh, it is a new way to uh, for retail trade. Uh, I think that the business model there has to change. It will be a mix of various kind of responses so in the shop, mm -hmm. uh, online, delivery home. Uh, and uh, the, the, the second wave may, may push it even further in this direction. But it is too early to say. And I think all what we should do is to be extremely prudent to avoid the double hit. Um, Governor, I'm also getting quite a lot of questions on um, PEP and actually the unwinding of, of you know, some of the special measures. When will this happen? I mean, could, could we see a ECB balance sheet increasing for the next five to 10 years? Or how do you see the timeline of this progressing? Well, it's, first of all, it's very hard to make any projection here. Uh, we have to see where we are. And for the time being, I compare myself, ourselves, the, the European Central this, the euro system, because this is a combination of the balance sheet of all the national central banks and, and the ECB with the Federal Reserve. And um, I think net of gold reserves that we have and they don't uh, because they are in the, in the, the state, in, in, in the federal system. The, the, my impression is that we are on the same page. Uh, there is an interesting mm -hmm. issue here is uh, what is the transmission of monetary policy which is different because we our transmission is still mostly to the banking system in that case is to the market system and this is why there is also uh, per direct purchases of certain kinds of instruments that we don't buy say mortgage related and so on. but at the end the this uh, is is similar japan is is a different uh, mm -hmm. story and, and then uh, and we will learn a lot from japan so let's see what happens there and then <laughs> and then we meet. But I'm not worried at all. And as I was saying, um, for the time being, uh, obviously we have a substantial amount of Italian debt in our balance sheet and we uh, give back to the government interest uh, received on uh, the, the profits that we make out of that once we have uh, uh, put proper reserves reserves in our uh, to take care of the risks. But uh, my impression is that so far there is how long. Well, I would say reinvestment has to go on for some time. Uh, certainly, the monetary stance has to remain easy for a long time. I mean, we still have projections that it will take years before we go to uh, what we define define as price stability. 
and we have to avoid mistakes. We have been able to avoid the deflation and there were risk of deflation, uh, notwithstanding what some uh, of others say, in, uh, in uh, between the mid of last uh, of the decade that is ending now. Uh, and, uh, and we have been able really to counter them consistently through, also through QE. So this is, this is a, new, a new instrument that we have. And as many say, say Ben Bernanke and others, these new instruments will stay with us. So we will, be, we will learn how to, to do that. But just to give you another example, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit older than, than many, many of my colleagues. Uh, and I studied in the late 60s, early 70s. At the time, there was a single budget constraint. That is, the central bank and the public sector had a single constraint. Uh, and therefore, it was considered basically uh, uh, possible to finance certain expenditures, either issuing debt uh, once you, have, or you were in a deficit mode, or paying... Uh, or through issuing a money supply. I think rightly this has been dismissed because there were risk of inflation, uh, political risks uh, attached to that, strings and so on. But uh, it is extremely important to have a clear idea about what monetary policy can achieve, what fiscal policy can achieve. They both work on the demand side of the economy. They don't work on the supply side, uh, at, le at least they don't work much on the supply side. Certain real rates are more difficult to be uh, changed by the state of monetary policy. They come from the economy being capable of being on a structural path, which is uh, helpful, which is, uh, which is conducive to growth. And this is, this is the difference. I think this is the main difference rather than the one about the uh, composition of the balance sheet of uh, central banks. Um, Governor, I'm also getting a lot of questions on, on the banking system and some of the banks in Italy. Um, so this person is writing in, could second tier banks survive with the second round of new non-performing loans? Well, first of all, I have to say that uh, the first round of new performing loans has been met in a very difficult circumstances because Italy has been tremendously hit by the combination of the global financial crisis and the sovereign debt crisis. Uh, and this, the real economy has suffered a lot, uh, probably has, uh, has fallen by 10 percentage points more or less, which is, by the way, what we are foreseeing more or less for uh, post-COVID. So it is, uh, it is correct to somehow to have this in mind. Uh, and uh, in that case, uh, there, has, there has been a substantial fall in uh, the uh, quality of credit. Uh, but, uh, and a number of banks have suffered from that. At the end, uh, I used to say that the Italian system was, was solid uh, in its entirety. But obviously there were a number of pieces which were very weak and some of them did not manage really to resist. How much? Less than 10%. 90% of the system has gone through this very difficult period in, 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 in sufficiently well. Now, what about now? Well, uh, clearly we start from a much better position in the banking system than 10 years ago. The capital ratios of banks have doubled the uh, non-performing loans are more or less back to where they were before. The it has improved. The percentage of uh, firms at risk or at high risk, we have a number of definitions on, is substantially lower than in 2007-8. The household debt is extremely low, and indeed, uh, differently than other countries, we do not have risk on the mortgage side. The uh, debt of uh, firms is uh, below the average of the euro area. Uh, and in terms of GDP, the, com the combined 
the debt of households and firms is the lowest. Lowest. Uh, so, so in this sense, I think there is a resilience in the system. This said, it is obvious there will be heat, and it is obvious, ob also obvious that there is a big problem in terms of profitability. So uh, capital is higher, but there is not enough profitability to maintain the banks free from the risks that may accumulate on the credit side. And, and uh, there are small commercial banks, some small commercial banks, that probably will have to uh, uh, somehow uh, be part of uh, uh, exercises uh, in which the aggregation with others and uh, has to be conceived. The big problem we are facing in Europe is the difficulty in dealing with uh, in in uh, managing a bank crisis there are uh, too many to well, i said this many times so it's well known but there are uh, too many actors and not enough uh, not enough instruments uh, now we have suspended for some time these uh, uh, these uh, state aid uh, rules regulation no for and this should be applied probably the suspension for those banks which will be hit by the covid if yeah. they will we have to monitor them very very carefully but uh, i think the situation is better than we used to have during the sovereign debt crisis and before but that, govern the global i mean given what you've just explained how crucial is mna in the italian banking system for banca d'italia well, I think we have a clear uh, evidence uh, only in one case, which is uh, two uh, banche popolari, that is, uh, that is co two medium large cooperative banks that merged. Uh, they are, did not go to uh, a very profitable state, but uh, this uh, these, uh, merged bank is, is, doing, uh, is doing okay. Uh, the uh, recent exam experiment is extremely important. We have now two groups that lump together the small cooperatives. We had more than 200 cooperatives which have been lumped together. Uh, many say, say, said, used to say, and perhaps still say, the Italian banking system is still too large and too fragmented. But really looking at it, uh, once we consider these two groups as single entities and there is still work to be done but it is important i will explain why why in a moment the fact that they have been there in this in this uh, in this exercise uh, the we, at the end we have about 100 uh, slightly more than 100 banks in the whole country even the branches have dramatically fallen the big challenge will be how to deal with digital services with digital banking with responding to tax, uh, big tax and so on. But on the on the smaller banks, I think the aggregation has been uh, now uh, conceived in this grouping of small co-ops, which this a co-op cannot go in the mar to the market. Statutory cannot go. Can only uh, cover losses uh, through the uh, contributions that come from earnings and in difficult circumstances there are no earnings or uh, contributions capital increases by by the, the, the those who own the the co-op the participants of the co-op when uh, times become hard it's very difficult to cope with that and there are many risks on that side in uh, having put these all the banks in, in in groups helps going to the market constrains mm -hmm. the banks really to maintain standards, uh, very strong standards within, but maintains also the major uh, idea of uh, a small co-op that being local and being helpful to the small and medium uh, enterprises of the locality where it is. So th this is now, there are, as you probably hinted, other mergers that are being uh, su suggested or being part of the the discussion uh, i cannot enter into discussing each or, or 
uh, example because as you understand we are part of the responsible for the supervision and the regulation of this sector on the other hand uh, it is interesting to observe that uh, there is uh, an attempt at uh, considering uh, uh, aggregation like this also the prerequisites for being more active at the European level and you know the European level is really the missing actor there that is uh, when in 1999 when we started the European Union there was a lot of predictions that we would have uh, European banks real fully fledged mm. banks for Europe and instead, we still have national banks, mostly national banks. It is very difficult to have a banking union which is uh, uh, strong if you don't have the progress on uh, other uh, areas of union, be, be that financial services, be that capital markets, be that fiscal okay. union. Um, Governor, we're almost out of time, so maybe just one or two final questions. Do, do you think that we will see a cross-border uh, merger and acquisition transaction in the banking sector soon? And would you be in favor to postpone dividends paid out at banks until 2021? I, I don't understand the second question. Do the, the second question is, is, is there's, there was a recommendation not to pay dividends to shareholders from no, no, the no, banks should that be no, no, postponed I, to january 21. Yeah. well i also heard uh, the chair of the uh, supervisory board really to to be uh, in favor of not postponing in the future is high uh, we should be careful extremely careful also mm -hmm. on uh, bonuses that are provided uh, for a number of reasons but one of the reasons is, is, is really related to COVID uh, and uh, on the first question uh, I, I, I mean well I'm, I'm not sure I can. I, I mean, let's let's try to to put it in perspective. What I mean, what is the interest of that question? That is what you are interested in asking. In that whether we'll see a big merger soon. Yeah, but why? Why? I mean, what, what, do, do you have? Uh, Bec you know, well, the governor, reason, you know, in well, this you time, in this time frame, is extremely difficult to talk about no. this kind. Of so this is, if instead you want an answer whether I'm in favor of banking union delivering yeah, yeah. cross borders, yes, yeah, of course, but yeah, I cannot yeah. expect this taking place now. And I think that we should have a banking union fully fledged, and we don't right. have a banking union yeah. fully fledged. So, so the, this is. So if you're interested in knowing structurally what I think, yes, but now yeah. I think we better survive and then we talk. As, as you say, <laughs> there is not a Latin say that says before philo philosophizing is better to survive. Uh, Governor, maybe one we, final... We are in the process of doing that. Maybe one final question um, from someone just on a positive note, right? So this person was saying, do you see any positive effect coming from COVID-19? Maybe additional jobs stemming from a more local supply chain is there anything that can come out that is that will be better out of the crisis this is a very important question because among the uh, non-linearities that we have not considered in the scenarios that we have made uh, there are on one side the financial amplification of the crisis on the other is major disruptions in the uh, value chains, supply value chains that we have been uh, somehow uh, uh, considering and uh, leading in uh, in the last uh, in the last uh, 
I say 10, 20 years. And there are signs that there are problems on the trade side, that, uh, but there are also changes from a technological point of view that may induce some retrenchment. Uh, this, uh, say, this gives to me only one major consideration that I have to forward. This calls for Europe to be more united and more interactive because uh, uh, this is the main thing. I, I think that at the end, the division of labor and the importance of uh, uh, somehow uh, having a distribution of uh, uh, production activities, not only in the, in the manufacturing, but also in the service sector, is mm -hmm. uh, cost effective and uh, to the benefit of all. But it has to be uh, somehow uh, also, uh, if you want, a substitute if there is uh, a difficulty uh, at the global level for uh, our geopolitical reasons, not only for uh, economic or uh, COVID-related uh, reasons, and therefore we need to have a stronger Europe, and we think the stronger Europe, global value chains in Europe have to be, have to be strengthened. Governor, thank you so much for uh, a great briefing and we'll have plenty more, of course, on, on Bloomberg. So we'll bring you more briefings and thank you to everyone who also submitted questions. I tried to, to fit as, as many as I could, but actually we had so many, Governor. We'll have to do it again in a couple of months. Thank you all and have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.